Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey. Hey. <laughs> that was a weird hi. Uh, hi, guys. How are you? Good. Great. Awesome. Gentlemen. Let's, and ladies, I do not care what is in between your legs. I just want to learn. Uh, preemptive like Munich and the foothills of the Alps. Absolutely. Rick Steves Europe. Awesome channel. Ryan Shirley. Uh, another great travel channel. Walter's World also. Uh, I don't think he has uh, as good visuals. So it's like Walter's World is good kind of travel facts. Ryan Shirley is amazing uh, images. And then Rick Steves Europe is kind of like both and a little bit of history thrown in. So uh, Munich and the foothills of the Alps. Let's go. I have driven from Amsterdam, to, like drove through Frankfurt, a little town called Koblenz, and then the outsides of, of Munich, uh, where we, I, I really, we really didn't even go into Munich. We just needed to stay a night outside of Munich so that we could do what we intended to do, which was drive uh, up Germany, I guess, just lower Germany. Anyways, um, and it was one of the most beautiful experiences in my life, driving from Munich to Innsbruck, Austria, Innsbruck, Austria to Bern, and uh, it's it just so beautiful. Let's go. Exploring more of the best of Europe. This time, it's quintessential Germany, and that means Bavaria. Fairy tale castles, the exciting city of Munich, and fun in the breathtaking Alps. The roads on the Alps were the steepest, scariest, sketchiest roads I've ever been on. Also, the I've been to a lot of McDonald's, guys. Europe has way better McDonald's. And the most beautiful McDonald's I've ever seen is in Austria. Or very close like to so many travelers, my images of Germany are actually of Bavaria. Castles in the Alps, lederhosen, beer gardens, and picturesque churches. I find Bavaria to be the most scenic, charming, and culturally rich part of the country. We'll immerse ourselves in Munich's art and history. Crown jewels, bony relics, great paintings, lush and playful parks. Munich evenings are best spent in frothy beer halls. Then we'll head for the foothills of the Alps to see Europe's most famous castle, pop over the Tyrolean border to explore a nearly unknown castle, and finish atop Germany's highest peak. Matterhorn? Germany is the heart of Europe, and Bavaria is the southern end of the country. From Munich, we venture into the foothills of the Alps to see King Ludwig's fantasy castles, take a hike over the border into Austria's Tyrol, and finally scale the Zugspitze mountain. So we went, like, down here, and then here, and then we went down here to a, 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 a town called uh, Innsbruck, Austria, and then through, barely went into Liechtenstein, into uh, Switzerland and then back into France towards uh, Paris again. So this stretch of land from, he from here to here, most beautiful I've ever seen in my life. Just the amount of amazing giant cliff mountains, crystal clear water, it's amazing. I'll, I'll, Munich is considered Germany's much. most livable city. While packed with history, it's also this country's Hollywood and Silicon Valley all rolled into one. This city celebrates its traditions with gusto. And at the same time, it remains a modern cultural force. Marienplatz, or Mary Square, marks the old center. The neo-Gothic New City Hall, or Neues Rathaus, is only about 100 years old. It dominates the square. This inviting town square is now Munich's living room. The Glockenspiel performs at the top of the hour as the Bavarian royal couple, celebrating their wedding day, oversees a joust. Bavaria always wins. And the Coopers do their jig. Virtually all you see was bombed flat in World War II and rebuilt since. Guys, am I doing a little bit of a stretch, but do you think that the formation of Germany is a bit similar to the formation of the United States in that it was a bunch of smaller states that came together in order to uh, have a better chance of 
fighting your enemy. And the German case, Franco-Prussian War, uh, was with France. Us, it was the, the British Empire. Maybe I'm just going out too far on a limb there, but I think we're pretty similar in that case. After the war, Germany's destroyed cities debated how they'd rebuild. They could reconstruct their old centers or bulldoze and start over from scratch. While Frankfurt voted to go modern, and today it's nicknamed Germany's Manhattan, the people of Munich decided to rebuild their old center. Buildings cannot exceed the height of the church spires. Today, Munich's downtown is vital. People come here, rather than to suburban malls, to do their shopping. Munich's main drag is one of Europe's original great pedestrian zones. Local business people were enraged in 1972 when cars were first prohibited. But now, with 9,000 shoppers passing their display windows each hour, shopkeepers are happy. Imagine this street in hometown USA. I'm being joined by my friend and Munich guide, George Reichelmeyer. So it's Reichelmeyer. Reichelmeyer. I can't roll my arm. So, you know, Bavaria, the state, uh, is a very conservative part of Germany. But Munich, the capital, is different. It's a very liberal city. One of the ideas of the council is to keep the traffic outside. And that makes downtown München a very silent place. Uh, it's quiet over here. You have green areas uh, always and a good public transportation system. So leave your car outside. You can still feel small town Munich here at the Victulian Market, long a favorite with locals for fresh produce and friendly service. While this most expensive real estate in town would have been overrun by fast food places, Munich keeps the rent low so these old time shops can carry on. The Victulian Market's beer garden taps you into great budget eating. Stalls sell the best first, sandwiches, produce and much more. All six of Munich's breweries enjoy a share of the business. At the beer counter, a sign which changes every day or two announces which of the beers is being served. Today's beer is Paulaner. A great thing I, I tend, I'm noticing about European countries and Europeans in general is that America is like business over everything. And so I feel like there's so much less like nostalgia of keeping something... Uh, historical or whatever I, I think it's like business over anything and so uh yeah i the I, other countries seem to want to aren't as like business crazy and and like the best buyer wins and and keep a sort of traditional look to it and i think you guys are much better than that that's a big quality. beer gardens like this go back to the days when breweries stored their beer in cellars under courtyards kept cool by the shade of bushy chestnut trees with the inviting shade and all that cool beer so handy it was only natural that tables were set up and these convivial eateries evolved The twin and distinctive domes of the 500-year-old Frauenkirk are the symbol of Munich. Survive. But an even more historic church is nearby. St. Peter's Church is Munich's oldest. Built where the early monks probably settled in the 12th century, it has a fine interior and some eye-catching relics. They say Munich has more holy relics than any city outside of Rome. Why? Because for over a hundred years, it was the Pope's bastion against the rising tide of Protestantism up here in Northern Europe. And favors done for the Pope earned the city lots of relics as gifts. The tomb of Mundita, thought to be a second century martyr, was given to Munich by Rome as a thanks and... Silesia and Saxony, Germ they were two, weren't they two pretty big German states in between Prussia and Austria? Um, it's kind of random, I just... ...thought to be a second century martyr, was given to Munich by Rome as a thanks and as a vivid reminder that those who die defending the Roman church He's go looking. directly to heaven without waiting for Judgment Day. Munich, or München as it's called in German, was long the capital of an independent Bavaria. Its royal architecture and grand boulevards constantly remind visitors that this was once a political and cultural powerhouse. For maximum imperial Bavarian grandeur, Guys, tour question. the residents. But was Bavaria ever its own state, or has it always been a region? Like, was there ever like like a Saxony, Prussia, Austria, Silesia, 
Bavaria, or was Bavaria never like a one, one thing? This was the palace of the Wittelsbach family, who ruled Bavaria for more than 700 years. Like so many of Munich's architectural treasures, it was destroyed in World War II and rebuilt since. To meet the Duke, all official guests had to pass through this gallery lined with 700 years of Wittelsbach portraits. Always trying to substantiate the family claim to power, they included the great Charlemagne as an honorary family member. When was he, 700s, 800s? The paintings are scarred by knife marks. In the final months of World War II, when Allied bombs were imminent, Nazi leaders gave the hasty order to slice each portrait out of its frame and hide them away. The Wittelsbachs were always trying to keep up with... You'd think they'd cut kind of more over here. Maybe there's just... ...hide them away. The Wittelsbachs were always trying to keep up with the Habsburgs, their Austrian imperial rivals. And this long string of ceremonial rooms was basically all for show. The exuberant decor and furniture is from the 1700s, Rococo. And of course, I love old Austrian Empire uniforms. I think they were the best during the Napoleonic era. The Wittelsbach family had their own porcelain made for the palace. With all the mirrors, it's porcelain forever. So, you know, the whole palace was really for showing off. And imagine the Duke bringing some of his most noble guests in here with all these miniatures in here, some even painted with just one hair brushes. That was really a sensation those days. So these were copies of all the great- I just need to get my water, it's right over there. I don't need this. Okay, let me go back like 10 seconds. Of all the great seconds. brushes. That was really a sensation those days. So these were copies of all the great masters. Copies of the best paintings. The palace ballroom was decorated with ancient Roman statues. The Wittelsbachs, like other European royals, collected and displayed busts of emperors, strongly implying a connection between them and the Caesars. Rome is the pinnacle. Ameri the United States of America, um, the British, the if you want to call them America an empire, I, 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 I'm, I think you that's okay to say. Uh, uh, it's plausible, not can't be refuted. But, like, the big powers in history, I, I, can we mention the USA as one? Like, one of the big powers in history? Along with the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, Portuguese, pretty big, Spanish Empire, um, the French Empire, uh, whatever, you want, whatever empire you want to say, right? It seems like none of them have even become even close to the to just the admiration that the Roman Empire had and how it seems like ever since the Roman Empire fell, it's like, yeah, it fell, but everyone, like, it, it was so powerful and so well-known for so many centuries, the Republic and then the, the uh, dictators, and then the Empire. Um, and that is crazy, just over two millennia, there's just almost two millennia. I guess it's not so much anymore. So about 2,000 years of just wanting to be like, yeah. It, it, so many different societies like claiming some something like that as it was just such a big deal that it just, it means it exudes legitimacy. And I just, it seems like there has never been anything like the Roman Empire prior to it, and I don't think there's been anything since like it. Not even America or the British Empire. Um, yeah. And it's always cool when they're always like, yeah, that, that, 
Uh, you know what I mean. The palace treasury shows off a thousand years of Wittelsbach knickknacks and Bavarian regalia, the inspiration for so many fairy tale crowns. Small mobile altars allowed kings to pack light and still have a focus for their worship while on the road. This crucifix, carved from ivory, is exquisite. Ivory. This reliquary, made in 1640, shows St. George killing the dragon. It sparkles with over 2,000 precious stones. You can almost hear the dragon. Guys, you know how, like, ivory is such an amazing sculpting material, and so it's... But obviously, it, it, that's a giant reason for poaching, right? It's so sad to see, like, rhinos, pictures of dead rhinos that were just killed, chopped off their horn, or an elephant that was killed, chopped off the tusks, and then just body left to rot. Is there any way, I mean, we're making growing meat and stuff, is there any way to, like, grow the keratin that is in ivory so it can be... This crucifix, carved from ivory, I'm talking too much about exquisite. random stuff. This reliquary, made in 1640, shows St. George killing the dragon. It sparkles with over 2,000 precious stones. You can almost hear the dragon hissing. It was designed to contain the relics of St. George. The what is it with ancient people's with fascination garden. with dragons? Today, it's the realm of everyday people rather than kings, dukes, and counts. Nice grass. Back then, when the king called out for dinner, he called Alois Dahlmeier. This royal delicatessen became famous for its exotic and luxurious food items. All the royal delicatessen became famous for its kiwi, a uh, tangerine. Is that meat? Uh, is that a cucumber or squash or a zucchini? It's exotic and luxurious food items. All the tropical fruits, seafood, Dragon fruit. chocolates, great wines, and fancy treats a king could want. Catering to royal and great wines and fancy treats a king could want. Hello, miss. Sorry. Catering to royal and aristocratic tastes and budgets, it remains the choice of Munich's connoisseurs of fine living. Too many calories? Bikes can be rented quickly and easily at the train station. Biking makes as much sense in You're cities not in like Disneyland. Munich as it does in the countryside. This city, level and compact with plenty of bike paths, feels good on two wheels. Okay, I, I tell this story so many times, but I'm telling it again. I'm in Amsterdam, okay, Netherlands, and there are bikes everywhere. Everywhere. Like, it's how people get around. And in a very flat country like the Netherlands, I, you know, I can see it's more easy. But it, it's a good thing, you know, exercise. You get exercise, and you don't create emissions, right? And, um, but me, with my American brain being there, and me and my dad and brother renting bikes, and I, I'm, I'm just being like, oh, my God, like, everyone's on a bike ride. Like, woo! And some lady behind me uh, in English, which just, I guess... She knew right away that I was American, which is hilarious. And she's like, this isn't Disneyland. And then I'm just like, oh, crap. Because I'm an idiot, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, bike ride. They're actually going to work and to do things. Sorry. In fact, with all these bike and pedestrian zones, that. you can often get around faster here on two wheels than you can by taxi. Like, that's so crazy, seeing an older woman in like business attire riding a bike in America is like, huh, where's your diesel quad tire F340 truck? Then you can buy taxi. For your minivan. Munich's 200 year old English garden sprawls over three miles through the city. It's the largest urban park on the continent. Bigger than Central. On a sunny summer afternoon, thousands of sun worshippers enjoy its varied attractions at the same time. Ooh, frisbee. We're here in August, and the surf's up. How? Is there when a the stream enters dam? the park? Its swift flow forms a perpetual wave for local surfers. Oh, that's great. 
wandering further along, the stream becomes as laid back as the sunbathers on its banks. That's so While awesome. a local law requires people to wear clothes on um, yep. city trams, Munich's parks are sprinkled with nude sunbathers. Students, office workers, and families alike enjoy a sunny break from the daily grind. This relaxed attitude toward nudity is commonplace in much of Europe. Okay, they're all men that I saw. Okay, not to monetize. There are several huge beer gardens within the park. On a so you're telling me that if I went to Germany, right outside this park, and then I just like stripped all my clothes off and walked naked over here, people wouldn't even be like, They'd just be like, oh, oh yeah, huh? That's pretty cool. And families alike enjoy a sunny break from the daily grind. This relaxed attitude toward nudity is commonplace in much of Europe. There are several huge beer gardens within the park. On a balmy summer evening, these are a good stop for dinner. Traditionally, beer gardens allow picnickers to... Oh, hey, you, America, is like... um. At a beach, right? You're a cop at a beach in like Florida, and you see two people. One of them is nude on the beach, and one of them is carrying uh, an AK-47 and a shotgun, but he has a license. Okay, the cop is gonna go, "Hey, what are you doing there?" Me? No, you, the naked one. You're arrested, America. To bring their own food and use a table if they buy a beer. Both. We're eating as Bavarian as possible. I was about to say that's the most I've German image. I've got my image. fish on a stick here. What do you call this in German? It's a steckelfish. 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 Fish. Uh, a nice big pretzel. Your pretzel. Carefully carved radish. You've got what? No that's ketchup. Pork knuckle. Me. Pork knuckle. Yes, that's a big portion of meat. And big beers. And big beers. München. Cheers. Both. Isn't it pros? Whether you bring your own food or buy it here, this is a classic Munich Gemütlich scene. Gemütlich is a unique word for Bavaria's special coziness and knack for savoring the moment. Hey, did you guys know that um, in America, German is the largest ancestry group of Americans than any other one? You might have thought it was English. Incorrect. Hell, we have the Amish, who only speak Old High German. Munich's many grand facades recall the city's cultural importance for this region. As the capital of Bavaria for centuries, Munich was able to amass lots of great art. And a cluster of museums shows off masterpieces through the ages. Got 19th century art just over there, a wonderful collection of modern art across the street, and we're heading for the Old Masters at the Alta Pinacothek. The Alta Pinacothek, or Old Painting Gallery, shows off Bavaria's best collection of European masterpieces from the 14th through the 18th centuries, featuring work by many of the greats. Botticelli's Lamentation shows the early Renaissance ability to show spirituality through human emotions. Leonardo's Madonna with a Carnation was done when the artist was only 21, well on his way to Mona Lisa greatness. And in this marvelous holy family, Raphael is clearly the master of grace. Paintings give a peek at the tumult. Clearly the master of grace. How do they... What I don't know about when you're painting someone is that... I mean, they can't, especially the kids, can't just stay... St I mean, isn't that an angel? I'm stupid, never mind. Paintings give a peek at the tumultuous events as Germany woke from its medieval slumbers and entered a new epoch. In this self-portrait, Albert Dürer, one of the class of 1500, heralds an optimistic new age. Dürer brings the humanistic spirit of Italy's Renaissance to the medieval north. He looks like he should be in uh, Sabaton, the band. Dürer brings the humanistic spirit of Italy's Renaissance to the medieval north. Recently returned from Italy, Dürer portrays himself, the artist, with unprecedented self-esteem. When this individualism met church authority, sparks flew. Durer's four apostles seem to reflect the turbulent times when the Reformation swept through Northern Europe. With the rugged features of everyday people, they take the Bible into their own hands, a humanist coup that ignited an all-Europe war. Looking around suspiciously, they clutch a Bible in one hand and a sword in the other, prepared to defend their beliefs. 
1517, the German monk Martin Luther broke with the church in Rome. People, uh, and I used to be of this belief of like, so much death and war throughout history is caused by religion, right? And what I don't like is like, imagine how much more peaceful the world would be without religion. I don't know if I believe that. Um, I'm not, a, I, look, I am not a religious person. I've been to church once, maybe twice in my life. Once was where I got kicked out because I was too loud and I had to leave and I was like six, me and my sister. And then the second time was in college in a theology class where an option for the end thing was to like go to, go to a church on campus and like tell about your experience, right? I'm not a religious person, but I think that humans will fight over anything that they think is right and others are wrong. And religion just happened to be that thing. Suddenly, people had to choose, am I Protestant or Catholic? Albert Durer actually met Martin Luther. He was impressed um, with his ideas and became one of his supporters. For Catholic? The Catholic Church responded with the Counter-Reformation and also used art as a weapon. The Church hired Rubens to show the epic battle, St. Michael hurling Lucifer out of heaven. So weird, I thought I had to sneeze and I yawned. Hired Rubens to show the epic battle, St. Michael hurling Lucifer out of heaven. The lesson? Those who oppose God's will shall lose. Believers had the entire mass to ponder these scenes. And I know what God's will is and you don't. All these heavenly battles mirrored what was going on in Europe. After 30 years of religious wars, a third of Germany was dead. It really looks like the room where the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre. Kind of like if he were to walk a little bit forward and then to the left and then straight. Finally, in 1648, an exhausted Europe made a treaty enabling Protestants and Catholics to coexist. Munich has so much to see, and we've saved the liveliest stop for last. For traditional Bavarian fun, nothing beats a good old-fashioned beer hall. Munich is Germany's beer capital and the Hofbrauhaus is its ultimate beer hall. It comes complete with rivers of beer, cheap food, beer hall, beer hall pooch, boisterous atmosphere, and ruckus oompa music. Even if you're not eating or drinking, check it out. While it can be extremely touristic, everybody's having lots of fun. Beer comes in huge liter mugs called Ein Mas in I could get along with people here, that's for sure. German or Ein Pitcher in English. Oh, what's the oldest beer? Um, it starts with an L. Um, it was a it was a blonde beer. Leben Leben Lebe. Forget. In huge liter mugs like called it, it Ein Mas was... in German or Ein Pitcher in English. Formed in like 1206. You can order your beer Helles, that's light, Dunkles, that's dark, or Radler, half lemon soda and half beer. Munich is the home of the famous Oktoberfest, but you can enjoy essentially the Which happens in September, right? Same Oktoberfest fun any time of year, right here at the Hofbrauhaus. Oh. From Munich and ours. Grass, grass, so good. This drive takes us deep into southern Bavaria. It's How a timeless it so land good? of manicured fields, painted buildings, content cows, and characteristic onion domed churches. This is I, a I always think of the onion domed churches with or onion domed um, religious buildings. I kind of associate it with Islam, but obviously. It's deep into southern. Or maybe like a more Eastern Orthodox. But. Bavaria. It's a timeless land of manicured fields, painted buildings, content cows, and characteristic onion-domed churches. This is a playground for people enjoying the good life at the foothills of the Alps. 
and it's a land of fairy tale castles. And the most spectacular, <laughs> the castles. <laughs> of King Ludwig II of Bavaria, a.k.a. Mad King Ludwig. He grew up here in the Hohenschwangau Castle. Poor guy. Ludwig then built his dream castle, Neuschwanstein. A Isn't that what uh, Disney World? 15-minute hike away. The castles are hugely popular, and they're tourable only by appointment with a guided tour. Tickets are sold at the kiosk in the valley floor. To avoid long lines, arrive early. Or, better yet, call in advance for a tour reservation. Hohenschwangau Castle, Ludwig's boyhood home, looks much like it did in 1836. It's the more lived in and historic of the two castles, giving a better glimpse at Ludwig's life. This is young King Ludwig's bedroom. Uh, he's, got, he's like a teenage boy with a bunch of Sports Illustrated swimsuit pictures. And this was his reading chair. The banquet hall is slathered in epic German myths. Germany became a single united country only in 1871. As Otto if to von Bismarck. legitimacy, this young nation dug deep into its murky medieval past. These heroes and legends inspired young King Ludwig. Otto von Bismarck, genius. To build his fanciful castles, Richard Wagner to compose his ultra-romantic operas, and Germans to believe their nation was deeply rooted in history. Politically, the frustrating reality oh, yeah. of young King Ludwig was to rule either as a pawn of Prussia or a pawn of Austria, the two dominant Germanic countries. Rather than deal with Silesia? the politics of Munich, romantic Saxon? Ludwig escaped here to the peace and comfort of Hohenschwangau. Ludwig ruled Bavaria for 23 years until his death in 1886. His best friends were romantic artists. I know nothing about them and I want to. Like the great composer Wagner, who Ludwig idolized. Neuschwanstein Castle is just up the hill. Is this the one? Imagine King Ludwig as a boy climbing these hills, dreaming up this ultimate fairy tale castle. It looks medieval, I but cry. it's only about as old as the Eiffel Tower. Oh. Built in Still. the late 1800s, it's a textbook example of the romantic style popular at the time. The castle's interior is decorated with misty medieval themes, brave knights, fair maidens, and scenes from Wagnerian operas. Ludwig personified this romantic age. Longing for the natural beauty and emotion of an earlier time, he built his medieval Imagine the romantic pain age. in the arse to clean the dust out of, off of this stuff. Longing for the natural beauty and emotion of an earlier time, he built his medieval fantasy on the hilltop, not for defensive reasons, but because he liked the view. King Ludwig intended to sit on a golden ivory throne in the company of six historic kings who were made saints. The religious Ludwig was fascinated by things Byzantine. Overrated empire. This room is based on the plan of a Byzantine church. And the one-ton chandelier is the shape of a Byzantine crown. People are gonna get Just mad a few at me. months after he moved into Neuschwanstein, Ludwig, who was already planning to build an even more extravagant castle, was declared mentally unfit to rule. Two days later, he was found dead in a lake. People still debate, was it murder or suicide? I'm gonna say murder. I'm gonna say he didn't take the, uh, you're not fit. Is he on a castle that's beautiful looking at you? Yeah, that's, uh, that's like Hadrian killing uh, Antonus. But nobody complains any longer about the extravagant cost of his fanciful castles. In fact, within six weeks of his funeral, tourists were already paying to visit them, and they're still coming. I'll be one. We're staying just over the border in the Austrian district of... You guys, so are these pine trees? What do you call the trees that aren't... Um, that don't have regular leaves, but have bristles. So are these like the same species of tree as in the entirety of like the North Northern Hemisphere, like Canada, U We're staying just over the border in the Austrian district mm. of Tyrolia. With far less tourism, this area offers great value and maximum charm. I sleep in the village of Pinswang at guesthouse Schluxen. 
My tour groups give this place the best remote hotel in an idyllic setting award. Run by Gracious Herman, this family-friendly working farm offers a great restaurant with plenty of Tyrolean ambience and tastefully <laughs> <modern> <laughs> look, at the, look at the kid use the fork. Tyrolean ambience. Classic. And tastefully modern rooms. From this comfy base, you can conveniently tour the region or just smell the geraniums and feed the deer. Oh, nice antlers. A hike up to the stark and brooding roof. Why aren't they running? Is hunting a big thing in Germany? A hike up to the stark and brooding ruins of Ehrenberg Castle provides a striking contrast to Ludwig's fantasy castles. Historian Armin Walsh is spearheading... I want to know, like, how high that is from here, like, if you were to walk into here and climb up to there. Can't be too high. I mean, there's a tree. Tree, 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 tree. In contrast to Ludwig's fantasy castles. Historian Armin Walsh is spearheading a project excavating and developing what he calls an ensemble of castles, which will create a unique open-air museum. We have uh, an ensemble of castles, four elements built in different periods. We start here in the Middle Age uh, with question. Ehrenberg. We have a Gothic... Question, question. So prior to... So during Roman times, prior to the Ro Roman collapse, or at least the Western Roman Empire collapsing, the, so did Germanic peoples east of the Rhine not have written language? Because the, we don't, why don't we know some an, uh, uh, element the, in the, the valley? We have a baroque castle and we have a... a brand new fortification system of the 18th century. We're visiting two castles of the ensemble, the 13th century Ehrenberg and, higher on the right, the 17th century Schlosskopf. This Where's is the eagle's nest? Because it lies on the 2000 year old Via Claudia Augusta. This is a, a road through the Alps, which connected Venezia, Italy with Germany. And this road was also in the Middle Age very important because it transported salt, the white gold. Anyone who controlled the oh, castles the controlled the trade. So in the Middle Age, they had to find the perfect hilltop to build the castle. A steep hike takes us up to the bigger and more modern Schlosskopf Castle, which Armin and his crew have just recently started uncovering. Well, Rick, um, two years ago, nobody in this town knew, or only few people knew that there was a fortification on top of the hill. Two years ago, you couldn't see anything. Uh, it was covered with trees. So you shaved this off? I was we shaved say. it, we cleaned it. It was completely covered with trees. So from right there, you couldn't see anything. <laughs> Whoa, all right. 100 foot drop. 30th century castles like Ehrenberg were built uh, with tiny walls, high towers on hills because of uh, the defense system of the Middle Age. Then they invented cannons. Cannons made this kind of architecture destroyable. This became clear in the early 1700s when, by cover of darkness, Imagine how far you could fire cannon shells, artillery, from the top of this thing. It's destroyable. This became clear in the early 1700s when, by cover of darkness, local Tyrolians wheeled two cannon up here and pulverized Ehrenberg Castle, which was occupied by their enemies, the Bavarians. From this point on, Ehrenberg-style castles were obsolete, and cannon-proof castles like Schlosskopf became the norm. Schlosskopf was built in 1741. Now we see the difference in architecture and fortification. They built here a fortification system, 250 meters long, thick walls, eight meter thick walls, tunnels, everything. A real fortification system for cannons. Modern warfare. Mo modern warfare. Meeting Europeans like Armin, so connected to their heritage and satisfied with their life's work. There's a sad part of me that thinks about all of the things that might have been in Germany that were just bombed to smithereens by the allies that just isn't there anymore. It's one of the fundamental charms of European travel. We're crossing from Austria back into Germany to ascend a mountain not capped Matterhorn? by a castle. 
Bouncing between countries, as you sightsee, is now easier than ever. I believe LeBlanc is the tallest one, but Matterhorn, I think, is in Germany. With the unification of Europe, border crossings are basically a thing of the past. And with the Euro, the same cash works in nearly all of Western Europe. The Zugspitze, at 10,000 feet, is Germany's highest mountain. Wait, what? Oh, the Matterhorn is in Switzerland, huh? Or northern, northern Italy. In There's Innsbruck. Yeah, so we must have taken the A12. We probably did the... Um, uh, so our hotel around here, and we either went this way or this way. Probably this way. And then up here and then to Innsbruck or maybe this way to Innsbruck. Okay. A mighty cable car zips us to the top in 10 minutes. The cable is supported by only two pylons and stretches the last mile to the summit with no support at all. That's crazy. While there may be many higher mountains in the Alps, this one's unique, standing alone with a view of over 400 peaks in four countries, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and even Italy. The mountain marks the border between the German state of Bavaria, or oh, Bayern, question, guys. and the Austrian state Isn't of- Isn't Northern Italy much more different than Southern Italy in that Northern Italy has more of like a, a central Northern European style? And so it was more sort of German. I'm, I'm just talking out my butt. I could be wrong. Of the Tyrol. And today, no passports are necessary to enjoy this high altitude resort destination on what feels like the top of Europe. The Zugspitze is named for a cold and ghostly wind which can really howl in the winter. This hiker's hut was built a hundred years ago. And thanks to these beefy cable tie downs, it's never been blown off the top. By the way, even on a sunny day, it can be cold up here. Bring a jacket. The summit is marked by a cross, carried up here by hardy villagers in 1882. Today, thanks to conveniently placed ladders and cables, it's climbed either from the distant valley floor or from the adjacent summit restaurant by families, seniors, and even travel riders. Whether you're scaling summits, birds conquering castles marveling at the treasures of munich or picking up slivers on a beer hall bench that one this region nestled here at the base of the alps is a joy this area is another reason europe just keeps drawing me back thanks for joining us i'm rick steves until next time keep on traveling auf wiedersehen auf wiedersehen love you guys um any germans here. Uh, I'd love to see if you live nearby any of these places or have been to these places or any comments in general. Love to see it. I love y'all. I hope you guys are all doing well and I'll see you guys next time. All right. Bye guys.